I'd like to welcome you all to the final physics colloquium of the year. Of course, in addition to being the final one, it's also a very special one because our guest and speaker is Professor Stephen Hawking of Cambridge University. Professor Hawking holds the same chair of mathematics as did at least two other illustrious physicists, Paul Dirac and Isaac Newton. Dirac, having given us much of the modern quantum theory and Newton, the classical theory of gravity. It's a delightful irony that Professor Hawking's principal work centers presently on the interrelation of quantum mechanics and general relativity, that is, modern gravitational theory. More specifically, his work on singularity theorems and radiation from black holes has led to and essentially created the field we know as quantum cosmology, in which he and many others now work and continue to make breathtaking discoveries. Many of you will have read his elegant and popular book, A Brief History of Time, but few will have read any of his original research articles, which although lucid and logical to the experts, would baffle, be baffling to you and me. Thus, you can perhaps appreciate more the other rare gift that he has, that of making almost colloquially comprehensible the most arcane and abstract formulations of what night he'll tell us something about, his, about this work in the talk entitled Baby Universes, Children of Black Holes. To take a phrase from his book in the chapter discussing the arrow of time and how, if we've remembered everything in the book, the order thus created in that little piece of the universe known as our brain has come at the expense of the larger disorder that we've created in the rest of the universe by the sweat of our brow to do so. He says, in the next chapter, I will try to increase the order in this neck of the woods a little further. So as not to delay his further attempts in this neck of the woods, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Professor Hawking to Brown. Can you hear? I expect this is the first time you have been addressed by a real computer. You may have seen science fiction films like 2001 or Blade 7 in which there were computers that spoke. But these films are really cheats. The computer parts were spoken by humans. The reason was that computerized speech synthesizers were not sufficiently good to be used in films or TV programs. But the speech synthesizer is a great improvement. It varies the intonation and gives me a voice that sounds almost human instead of like a Dalek. <laughs> the only trouble is that it gives me an accent that has been variously described as American, Scandinavian, or Irish. <laughs> the speech synthesizer is controlled by a small portable computer on the back of the wheelchair. The screen of the computer has been taken off and mounted on the arm of the wheelchair. On the screen, I have a menu which I can scan by pressing a switch in my hand. In this way, I can select words which are printed out on the lower part of the screen. When I have written what I want, I can send it to the speech synthesizer.
I can write scientific papers on this system. I write equations in words, alpha plus beta over two equals gamma. I have a program called Tech, which translates the equations into symbols and sets the paper in appropriate type. I have also used it to write a popular book, which is being translated into 18 languages. I realized it was going to be a success when I sold the rights in Serbo Croat. Now for my lecture. I will talk about black holes which ain't as black as they are painted. Instead, I shall show that they can shine white hot. And they can be the proud parents of little baby universes. Falling into a black hole has become one of the horrors of science fiction. In fact, black holes can now be said to be really matters of science fact, rather than science fiction. As I shall describe, there are good reasons for predicting that black holes should exist. And the observational evidence points strongly to the presence of a number of black holes in our own galaxy and more in other galaxies. Of course, where the science fiction writers really go to town is on what happens if you do fall in a black hole. A common suggestion is that if the black hole is rotating, you can fall through a little hole in space-time and out into another region of the universe. This obviously raises great possibilities for space travel. Indeed, we need something like this if travel to other stars, let alone other galaxies, is to be a practical proposition in the future. Otherwise, the fact that nothing can travel faster than light means that the round trip to the nearest star would take at least eight years. So much for a weekend break on Alpha Centauri. <laughs> on the other hand, if one could pass through a black hole, one might re-emerge anywhere in the universe. Quite how you choose your destination is not clear. You might set out for a holiday in Virgo, and end up in the Crab Nebula. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint prospective galactic tourists, but this scenario doesn't work. If you jump into a black hole, you will get torn apart and crushed out of existence. However, there is a sense in which the particles that make up your body do carry on into another universe. I don't know if it would be much consolation to someone being made into spaghetti in a black hole to know that his particles might survive. <laughs> Despite the slightly flippant tone I have adopted, this talk will be based on hard science. Most of what I shall say is now agreed by other scientists working in this field, though this acceptance has come only fairly recently. The last part of the lecture, however, is based on very recent work on which there is, as yet, no general consensus. 
but this work is arousing great interest and excitement. Although the concept of what we now call a black hole goes back more than 200 years, the name black hole was introduced only in 1967 by the American physicist John Wheeler. It was a stroke of genius. The name ensured that black holes entered the mythology of science fiction. It also stimulated scientific research by providing a definite name for something that, previously, had not had a satisfactory title. The importance, in science, of a good name should not be underestimated. <laughs> the first person, as far as I know, to discuss black holes was a Cambridge man called John Mitchell, who wrote a paper about them in 1783. His idea was this. Suppose you fire a cannonball vertically upwards from the surface of the Earth. As it goes up, it will be slowed down by the effect of gravity. Eventually, it will stop going up and will fall back to Earth. However, if it had more than a certain critical speed, it would never stop and fall back, but would continue to move away. This critical speed is called the escape velocity. It is about 7 miles a second for the Earth and about 100 miles a second for the Sun. Both of these velocities are higher than the speed of a real cannonball, but they are much smaller than the velocity of light, which is 186,000 miles a second. This means that gravity doesn't have much effect on light, and light can escape without difficulty from the Earth or the Sun. However, Mitchell reasoned that it would be possible to have a star that was sufficiently massive and sufficiently small in size that its escape velocity would be greater than the velocity of light. We would not be able to see such a star because light from its surface would not reach us but would be dragged back by its gravitational field. However, we might be able to detect the presence of the star by the effect that its gravitational field would have on nearby matter. It is not really consistent to treat light like cannonballs because, according to an experiment carried out in 1897, light always travels at the same constant velocity. So, how then can gravity slow down light? A fully consistent theory of how gravity affects light came in 1915 when Einstein formulated the general theory of relativity. Even so, the implications of this theory for old stars and other massive bodies were not generally realized until the 1960s. According to general relativity, space and time together can be regarded as forming a four-dimensional space, called space-time. The space is not flat, but it is distorted or curved by the matter and energy in it. Objects try to move on straight lines through space-time, but because it is curved, they move on paths called geodesics, 
which are the nearest thing to a straight line in a curved space. Thus, the Earth tries to move on a straight line, but because spacetime is bent by the mass of the Sun, it follows a spiral path, going in a circle around the Sun, while advancing in time. Similarly, light tries to move on a straight line, but because spacetime is curved, it appears to follow a path that is bent. We can actually observe this bending of light during an eclipse. The moon blocks out the sun and allows us to observe stars that are in almost the same direction as the sun. We find that the stars appear to be in slightly different positions because the light from them is bent by the curved spacetime near the sun. In the case of light passing near the sun, the bending is very small. However, if the sun were to shrink until it was only a few miles across, the bending would be so great that light leaving the sun would not get away, but would be dragged back by the gravitational field. According to the theory of relativity, nothing can travel faster than light. So there would be a region from which it would be impossible for anything to escape. This region is called a black hole. Its boundary is called the event horizon. It is formed by the light that just fails to get away from the black hole, but stays hovering on the edge. It might sound ridiculous to suggest that the sun could shrink to being only a few miles across. Surely, matter cannot be compressed so far. The answer is, it can. The sun is the size it is because it is so hot. It is burning hydrogen into helium like a controlled H-bomb. The heat released in this process generates a pressure that enables the sun to resist the attraction of its own gravity which is trying to make it smaller. Eventually, however, the sun will run out of nuclear fuel. This will not happen for about another five billion years, so there's no great rush to book your flight to another star. However, more massive stars will burn up their fuel much more rapidly. When they finish their fuel, they will start to lose heat and to contract. If they are less than about twice the mass of the sun, they will eventually stop contracting and will settle down to a stable state. The state can be what is called a white dwarf. These have radii of a few thousand miles and densities of hundreds of tons per cubic inch. Or it can be a neutron star. These have a radius of about 10 miles and densities of millions of tons per cubic inch. We observe large numbers of white dwarfs in our immediate neighborhood in the galaxy. Neutron stars, however, were not observed until 1967 when Jocelyn Bell and Tony Hewish at Cambridge discovered objects called pulsars, which were emitting regular pulses of radio waves. At first, 
they wondered whether they had made contact with an alien civilization. Indeed, I remember that the seminar room, in which they announced their discovery, was decorated with figures of little green men. In the end, however, they, and everyone else, came to the less romantic conclusion that they were rotating neutron stars. This was bad news for writers of space westerns, but good news for the small number of us who believed in black holes at that time. If stars could shrink as small as 10 or 20 miles across to become neutron stars, one might expect that other stars could shrink even further to become black holes. A star with a mass more than about twice that of the sun cannot settle down as a white dwarf or neutron star. In some cases, the star may explode and throw off enough matter to bring its mass below the limit. But this won't happen in all cases. Some stars will shrink so small that their gravitational fields will bend light so much that it comes back towards the star. No further light or anything else will be able to escape. The stars will have become black holes. We now have fairly good observational evidence for a number of black holes. One of the best cases is Cygnus X1. This is a system consisting of a normal star orbiting around an unseen companion. Matter seems to be being blown off the normal star and falling on the companion. As it falls towards the companion, it develops a spiral motion, like water running out of a bath. It will get very hot, and will give off the X-rays that are observed. The unseen companion must be very small, a white dwarf, neutron star, or black hole. However, one can show that the mass of the companion must be at least six times that of the sun. This is too much for it to be a white dwarf or a neutron star. So, it has to be a black hole. I once bet Kip Thorne of the California Institute of Technology that Cygnus X1 does not contain a black hole. This was not because I didn't believe that there really was a black hole in Cygnus X1. Rather, it was an insurance policy. I had done a lot of work on black holes and it all would have been wasted if it had turned out that black holes didn't exist. But then, at least, I would have had the consolation of winning my bet. However, I now consider the evidence for black holes so compelling that I'm going to concede the bet. I will give Kip Thorne a subscription to Penthouse. <laughs> the laws of physics are time symmetric. So, if there are objects, called black holes, which things can fall into, but not get out, there ought to be other objects, that things can come out of, but not fall into. One could call these white holes. One might speculate that one could jump into a black hole 
in one place and come out of the white hole in another. This would be the ideal method of long-distance space travel mentioned earlier. All you would need would be to find a nearby black hole. At first, this form of space travel seemed possible. There are solutions of Einstein's general theory of relativity in which it is possible to fall into a black hole and come out of the white hole. However, later work showed that these solutions were all very unstable. The slightest disturbance, such as the presence of a spaceship, would destroy the wormhole or passage leading from the black hole to the white hole. The spaceship would be torn apart by infinitely strong forces. After that, it seemed hopeless. Black holes might be useful for getting rid of garbage, or even some of one's friends. <laughs> but they were a country from which no traveler returns. However, everything I have been saying so far has been based on calculations using Einstein's general theory of relativity. This theory is in excellent agreement with all the observations we have made. But we know it cannot be quite right, because it doesn't incorporate the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. The uncertainty principle says that particles cannot have both a well-defined position and a well-defined velocity. The more precisely you measure the position of a particle, the less precisely you can measure its velocity, and vice versa. In 1973, I started investigating what difference the uncertainty principle would make to black holes. To my great surprise, and that of everyone else, I found that it meant that black holes are not completely black. They would be sending out radiation and particles at a steady rate. My results were received with general disbelief when I announced them at a conference near Oxford. The chairman of the session said they were nonsense and wrote a paper saying so. However, when other people repeated my calculations, they found the same effect. So, in the end, even the chairman agreed I was right. Please wait while I load the rest of my lecture. I will continue. How can a black hole give off radiation? How can anything get out through the event horizon of a black hole? The answer is, the uncertainty principle allows particles to travel faster than light for a small distance. This enables particles and radiation to get out through the event horizon and escape from the black hole. Thus, it is possible for things to get out of a black hole. However, what comes out of a black hole will be different from what fell in. Only the energy will be the same. As a black hole gives off particles and radiation, it will lose mass. This will cause a black hole to get smaller and to send out particles more rapidly. Eventually, it will get down to zero mass and will disappear completely. What will happen then to the objects, including possible spaceships, that fell into the black hole? According to some recent work of mine, 
The answer is that they go off into a little baby universe of their own. A small, self-contained universe branches off from our region of the universe. This baby universe may join on again to our region of space-time. If it does, it would appear to us to be another black hole, which formed, and then evaporated. Particles that fell into one black hole, would appear as particles emitted by the other black hole, and vice versa. This sounds just what is required to allow space travel through black holes. You just steer your spaceship into a suitable black hole. It better be a pretty big one, or the gravitational forces will tear you into spaghetti before you get inside. You would then hope to reappear out of some other hole, so you wouldn't be able to choose where. However, there's a snag in this intergalactic transportation scheme. The baby universes that take the particles that fell into the hole occur in what is called imaginary time. Imaginary time may sound like science fiction, but it is a well-defined mathematical concept. It seems essential, in order to formulate quantum mechanics and the uncertainty principle properly. However, it is not our subjective sense of time in which we feel ourselves as getting older with more gray hairs. Rather, it can be thought of as a direction of time that is at right angles to what we call real time. In real time, an astronaut who fell into a black hole would come to a sticky end. He would be torn apart by the difference between the gravitational force on his head and his feet. Even the particles that made up his body would not survive. Their histories in real time would come to an end at a singularity. However, the histories of the particles in imaginary time would continue. They would pass into the baby universe and would re-emerge as the particles emitted by another black hole. Thus, in a sense, the astronaut would be transported to another region of the universe. However, the particles that emerged would not look much like the astronaut. Nor might it be much consolation to him as he ran into the singularity in real time to know that his particles will survive in imaginary time. The motto for anyone who falls into a black hole must be Think imaginary. <laughs> what determines where the particles re-emerge? The number of particles in the baby universe will be equal to the number of particles that fell into the black hole plus the number of particles that the black hole emits during its evaporation. This means that the particles that fall into one black hole will come out of another hole of about the same mass. Thus, one might try to select where the particles would come out by creating a black hole of the same mass as that which the particles went down. However, the black hole would be equally likely to give off any other set of particles with the same total energy. 
If the select hole did emit the right kinds of particles, one could not tell if they were actually the same particles that went down the other hole. Particles do not carry identity cards. All particles of a given kind look alike. What all this means is that going through a black hole is unlikely to prove a popular and reliable method of space travel. First of all, you would have to get there by traveling in imaginary time and not care that your history in real time came to a sticky end. Second, you couldn't really choose your destination. It would be a bit like traveling on some airlines I could name. <laughs> Although baby universes may not be much used for space travel, they have important implications for our attempt to find a complete unified theory that will describe everything in the universe. Our present theories contain a number of quantities, like the size of the electric charge on a particle. The values of these quantities cannot be predicted by our theories. Instead, they have to be chosen to agree with observations. However, most scientists believe that there is some underlying unified theory that will predict the values of all of these quantities. There may well be such an underlying theory. Many people think it is the theory of superstrings. This does not contain any numbers whose values can be adjusted. One would therefore expect that this unified theory should be able to predict all the values of quantities, like the electric charge on a particle, that are left undetermined by our present theories. Even though we have not yet been able to predict any of these quantities from superstring theory, many people believe that we will be able to do so, eventually. However, if this picture of baby universes is correct, our ability to predict these quantities will be reduced. This is because we cannot observe how many baby universes exist out there waiting to join onto our region of the universe. There can be baby universes that contain only a few particles. These baby universes are so small that one would not notice them joining on or branching off. However, by joining on, they will alter the apparent values of quantities, like the electric charge on a particle. Thus, we will not be able to predict what the apparent baby universes exist in a realm of their own. It is a bit like asking how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. For most quantities, baby universes seem to introduce a definite, although fairly small, amount of uncertainty in the predicted values. However, they may provide an explanation of the observed value of one very important quantity, the so-called cosmological constant. This is a quantity that would give the universe an inbuilt tendency to expand or contract. On general grounds, one might expect it to be very large. Yet we can observe how the expansion of the universe is varying with time and determine that the cosmological constant is very small. 
Up to now, there has been no good explanation for why the observed value should be so small. However, having baby universes branching off and joining on will affect the apparent value of the cosmological constant. Because we don't know how many baby universes there are, there will be different possible values for the apparent cosmological constant. However, a nearly zero value will be by far the most probable. This is fortunate, because it is only if the value of the cosmological constant is very small, that the universe would be suitable for beings like us. To sum up, it seems that particles can fall into black holes, which then evaporate and disappear from our region of the universe. The particles go off into baby universes, which branch off from our universe. These baby universes can then join back on somewhere else. They may not be much good for space travel, but their presence means that we will be able to predict less than we expected, even if we do find a complete unified theory. On the other hand, we now may be able to provide explanations for the measured values of some quantities, like the cosmological constant. In the last year, a lot of people have begun working on baby universes. I don't think I will make my fortune by patenting them as a method of space travel. But they have become a very exciting area of research. Thank you. Although it's been a very long day, uh, Professor Hawking has consented to answer a few questions. No doubt it's raised a few in your mind. So if uh, people would raise their hands, I'll try to identify uh, you one by one, and then I'll try to repeat the questions. Yes. Ah, <laughs> the question was, could he elaborate on what is meant by imaginary time being at right angles to real time? Let's try to put questions in a form where we can get the simplest, most succinct answers. Could we try one more? Ah, in the balcony. The question is, is there any evidence that quasars are the exits of black holes? Restoring the questions and answers. It is like the way that imaginary numbers can be regarded as being at right angles to real numbers. I have another lecture on imaginary time, but it would take another hour. On this view, the black hole in the quasar would be connected to another black hole. What fell into the quasar would come out of the other black hole, 
as leg hole radiation. Is there another question? Yes? The question was, what is the probability that the experiments in Utah are demonstrating cold fusion? That is a very different matter. I think black holes are a much better bet. Yes, perhaps we can have one more. I couldn't get the question. <laughs> Let's have one more. Yes, so we're here. The question was, over what distance could a particle exceed the velocity of light uh, at an event horizon? The further it has to go faster than light, the slower is the rate. That is why big black holes give off radiation much slower than small black holes. I think we'll make that to be the last question. I want to thank you all very much for coming and for giving Professor Hawking such a rousing welcome. <laughs>